So our reading this morning is from the Old Testament book of Exodus. This is chapter 13. And I would just encourage you to be as normal, sort of visualizing what you can hear in this text and also listening for the Spirit's word to you and to the church in this time. Um, so here's what Exodus has to say. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was nearer. For God thought, if the people face war, they may change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people by the roundabout way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of the land of Egypt prepared for battle. And Moses took with him the bones of Joseph, who had required a solemn oath of the Israelites, saying, God will surely take notice of you, and then you must carry my bones with you from here. They set out from Sukkot and camped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. The Lord went in front of them in a pillar of cloud day by day to lead them along the way, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light, so that they might travel by day and by night. And neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. To that I would say, holy wisdom, holy word, thanks be to God. So I know this is not the case for all families, and so I do feel grateful that it was the case for mine, but my parents did not argue all that often when I was growing up, just sort of over the normal trials and tensions of families living together. But when I think back about it, I recognize that often when they did argue, it started in the car. <laughs> I wonder if anyone's had this experience. Now, I would attribute this to the fact that my parents have very different navigational methods which do not mesh terribly well together. So it is true, and everyone knows that my mom knows about this, my mother has just this innate sense of direction. Like in any city that's even moderately familiar to her, she can go literally anywhere. I mean, to this day, if you say, oh, I was going to stop by the mall on my way home, she'll say, yeah, you go down this street, but don't forget you have to be in the rightmost lane because you're going to curve onto this thing and then turn left at the gas station. So she could get anywhere. My father had no sense of direction, <laughs> but happened to be one of the world's best map readers. I mean, you give that guy a compass, he could get literally anywhere. He could read any kind of map, right? Contour maps, city maps, any maps he could read. The problem was, he literally could got, not get anywhere without a map. My parents went to the same church for about 26 years in Portland, and every single time, my dad used his GPS to go there from their house. <laughs> and think about 52 weeks a year times, that's a lot of times, right? Still using the GPS. So that combination of sort of believing you should get everywhere by innate sensibility and believing you needed a map to get anywhere, that combination was a little bit like explosive, as you can imagine. So, I, you know, my dad would be in the car with a map, like, I think we're going to go three blocks and turn right after 0.1 miles. My mom would be like, I think it's up here. I think we're just going to kind of go around, you know, and well, no, I think it's that you got to go this way, you know, and it did, just didn't mesh very well. And actually, I was so surprised. My parents had a very wonderful and long-term partnership. So once when talking about that, I just offhandedly asked my mom if she ever thought about divorcing my dad. And I was shocked when she said, of course. <laughs> she said, once we went to vac on vacation in the Bahamas and they drove on the other side of the road and driving back to our hotel from the airport, I thought I'm going to leave him right now. <laughs> um, which, which, thinking about it later, made sense, you know? And they would bicker a little bit about how to get placed in the car. And if we were on one of my mom's sort of intuitive routes, my dad would get really worked up. This is not how the map says to go. She would say, well, we're taking the scenic route. <laughs> and I was thinking about that the other day because actually Oliver has become of a bit of a navigator himself. Like, he's really into learning. Oh, we're going to turn left to go to church or left to go to school or where's that? And he just discovered the idea of shortcuts. Right? So he's always asking about taking shortcuts. Poor kid. It's a little limited by living on an island where there just aren't numerous ways to go anywhere most of the time. There's really only one shortcut on our way from home to school, and sometimes he'll to take it. And sometimes it just isn't practical right at the moment. We'll say, no, we can't take the shortcut. And he says, fine, I guess we'll take the long cut. <laughs> 
which when I read our scripture passage this morning from Exodus, I noticed exactly what's happening to the Israelites, right? Did anybody notice that? God is taking them on the long cut. Maybe we could say God is taking them on the scenic route. I don't know if you noticed that. Now I have to say just a little side, I was super excited about our scripture passage today because I honestly don't think that I've ever noticed this part of Exodus before, though I'm sure I read it. It's not anywhere in the lectionary, so we don't hear it in our regular schedule of readings. And I always get excited when I find new things in the Bible. And if you need some encouragement for reading your Bible, that's it. never gets old. Um, so here are the Israelites. They're leaving Egypt. They're finally free. This is the bit right after all the plagues. And the, just the bit right before the, uh, the Red Sea, which you remember from either Sunday school or Charlton Heston's Ten Commandments. And so they fled Egypt, and now it's just them and God, right? And God says, um, this way, over here, guys, right, here. But you've got to believe that some among them were like, wait a minute, shouldn't we be going that way? You know, or isn't it faster if we go over here through the bit about the Philistines, right? Because this way that you're taking us just leads to the dead end of the sea. You know, you got to imagine there were some skeptics among them, which imagining that actually fills me with comfort because I know it's sometimes hard to follow God, and I can sense that even when God is literally in front of you as a pillar of fire, there's some amount of uncertainty. But I also like this story because I think it references what I see as a very real tension that exists within most of us about how we navigate the broader terrain of our lives. You know, I don't know that on the one hand, many of us can easily wax poetic about how life is a journey and we should enjoy the ride. Perhaps we love travel and the experience of expanding our horizons as we're just completely present in the moment in new places, reveling in serendipity. Or perhaps we enact our spirit of discovery right in our own backyard. Look at this. Look at the beauty. Look at this day. But on the other hand, I think most of us admit we are profoundly affected by our culture's emphasis on expediency, right? The best route to get somewhere is the fastest one, right? The best line at the grocery store is the only one of you thinks the shortest one. The rest of you just get in the long line. I should go to your grocery store, right? The shortest line, right? The best time for something to happen that we want to happen is right now. And I think a lot of times these tendencies are often wrestling within us, right? We believe in waiting for the right time, but we really wish that time would hurry up. <laughs> we want to live in the moment, but then we find our mind wants to live in the future a little bit. And what I think this story from Exodus does, and the spiritual life more broadly, I think, is add another dimension to that internal struggle asking us to consider not only where we go or how we get there, but who we become as we go. You know, I think that's what this little quip about God's directional instruction of the Israelites is all about. I mean, why did God lead the Israelites through the wilderness rather than the faster route? Because God was worried that if they faced the trials along the shorter route, which was struggle with other peoples, they might lose their faith. So God took them along this longer road that would lead them to a different set of struggles. It was a more of an internal struggle for them to become, emerge as a unified and faithful people, relying on God and trusting God's endurance presence with them along the road. Um, so yes, it was about who they were to become along the journey, not only how they were to arrive at their destination. Now speaking of travel, I wonder if any of you out there are fans of the travel guru Rick Steves. Any Rick Steves people? Love Rick Steves. I just can't get enough of Rick Steves. That Lutheran guy who's just, you know, trotting around Europe all the time. I always loved his travel programs. And um, we always sort of, when we put them on in our house, we always say, well, this isn't really like screen time for the kids because it's educational, right? They're traveling the world. So I really appreciate the way that he frames travel as slightly distinct from tourism. Has anyone ever heard him talk about that, right? That that uh, tourism is like visiting a place and just seeing it, checking all the boxes, right? Trevi Fountain, check. Eiffel Tower, check. Big Ben, check, right? We see new sites, but we don't fundamentally change as a result of seeing those things. Now, when Rick Steves talks about travel, 
He talks about immersing oneself in another country or another place, right? Encountering its people, and that way expanding one's horizons, right? It's more about allowing a place to shape you than sort of consuming the wonders it has to offer. And I wonder if we can't talk about the spiritual life in similar terms. You know, for some people, the life of faith is kind of a checklist, like went to church on Sunday, check, you know, assured my salvation, check. Um, but I think a further journey is to consider the spiritual life as a path we walk with God in service to our becoming who God has meant us to be. You know, it's an exercise not only in believing the right things, or even in doing the right things, but in trusting God to guide us on a path which makes us righteous, right, whatever that means for each of us. You know, it may not be direct, it may not be immediate, but I think it is the sacred path that we're trying to take and hopefully that we're coming here seeking inspiration for. And I love that this little kind of tidbit from Exodus leads us to that. You know, I'm glad for the encouragement to trust in taking the long cut, in taking the scenic route, not only so that we can see beautiful things, but so that we can become a more beautiful version of the person God has invented us to be. And my point this morning is simply to commend that metaphor to your imagination as you make your way through this summer. You know, perhaps you'd like to ask yourself, where are you going? And I want you to think about that as broadly as you can. Where are you going geographically? Where are you going existentially? Where are you going spiritually, professionally? Where are you going in your relationships? What is the journey that you are on is another way to put it. Where are you going and how will you get there? What will you prioritize along the way? Timeliness or directness? Will you wait for the fullness of time to make your journey? Will you trust God's presence with you along the path? And here's the real question that I think is important to tend to on this day. Where are you going and who do you intend to become along the way? You know, when I think about all of the greatest spiritual wise folks, the sages throughout the ages, all of the patriarchs and matriarchs and scriptures, they were all spiritual travelers. They were all people who stepped over their threshold and out into the beautiful world that God made and found that even though they may have ended up far from the familiar, they came home to themselves. They came home to their community and certainly they came home into the presence of God. So I just offer that to you as you imagine or plan for or remember your summer travels and think about what's next for you in this spiritual life. So I offer these words in the name of the God who created, redeemed, and who sustained us always. Amen.